Good morning and welcome to the Kitty Hawk Investor Series. At Kitty Hawk, we are passionate about frontier technology and working with extraordinary entrepreneurs to build world-changing companies. We think that this is an absolutely extraordinary time where not only are you able to make a positive impact in the world, but you're also able to generate extraordinary financial returns. So this is our six year investing, and I want to just give you a, a very quick update. It's been a really exciting and, and uh, year for, for Kitty Hawk. Uh, we have had two companies become unicorns. We've had our first uh, 100x portfolio company. Both of our funds now are tracking uh, over 3x uh, invested capital. So Kitty Hawk Ventures 1 is uh, 3.3x and Fund 2 is at 3.5x. Uh, and feeling like giving the, the seeing the progress uh, that we're seeing in our portfolio companies uh, really feel like there's a very good probability that we're on our way to having kind of 5x plus funds, which is super, super exciting for us. We're now at $25 million in commitments for fund three. Uh, we're continuing to actively fundraise. I think we'll kind of keep that up for another couple months and then get our uh, heads down and, and focus uh, fully on investing. Uh, and also, as you may have seen, we're super active right now in terms of later stage SPVs. We've got about $80 million in uh, allocations that we're working through. So it's a very exciting time. I want to thank all of you for your support, uh, for being part of the fund, for being part of this community. If there's anyone out there who is interested in connecting to, to chat about uh, the fund itself or about any of our SPV opportunities, would really welcome the opportunity to connect with you. All right, so for today's call, we're gonna have about 30 minutes or so of fireside, uh, fireside conversation. We're then going to move to audience Q&A. Uh, and then, as you know, kind of one of the recurring themes here is my desire and kind of my love for building community. Uh, we really have some extraordinary people who are on the call today, the CEOs of some of our portfolio companies, our LPs, our advisors, and uh, just great friends of the fund who are doing interesting things out in the world. So uh, if we have some time at the end, we're going to break out into four person groups so you all can connect, get to know each other a little bit, and, and perhaps chat a little bit about today's conversation. All right. So with that, I am thrilled today to be able to welcome my great friend, uh, Ramez Nam. So Ramez and I have known each other for a little over eight years now. Uh, we got to know each other as a result of our work at Singularity University. Ramez is one of the world's preeminent thought leaders around energy and environment and was a frequent guest on our stage and, and the faculty chair for those two areas at Singularity University. He's a multifaceted uh, human being, really an extraordinary human being, a very accomplished author, both for fiction and nonfiction. If you are a fan of science fiction, his Nexus trilogy books are really extraordinary. And, and one of those books actually is the winner of the Philip K. Dick Award, uh, which is, if you're a science fiction fan, you know, is one of the uh, kind of highest accolades that you can receive in the science fiction world. Ramez is also a very active investor. Uh, he runs multiple syndicates. We've had the pleasure of being able to, to co-invest together on one deal uh, amply, uh, but excited to be able to hear from him about, uh, about some of the companies that he's investing in and some of the themes that, uh, that he is seeing. All right, so, um, so with that, let me uh, welcome Ramez Nam. Uh, Mez, it's amazing to have you here, my friend. Will, it's so awesome to be here. Great to see you, and thanks for having me on. Our continuing journey together. Yes, um, indeed. So my belief is that this is a really extraordinary time in human history. And, you know, as we've talked so many times uh, at SU, there's this opportunity to impact billions of lives today, right? And to create very meaningful businesses and, and financial uh, opportunities. And, and my belief is that we're right on the precipice of what I think is going to be one of the most extraordinary investment opportunities of, of our lives. And that is around climate change. Uh, and so, you know, there's an existential threat there. There's going to be incredible resources that are going to be directed towards solving these problems and creating a more sustainable um, uh, world. So I thought maybe we could kind of just start things off by getting your 
quick kind of overview, kind of a lay of the land on what you're seeing on the energy front. And then uh, afterwards, we can start to get into some of the specifics around some of the energy generation sources and, and technologies. Well, I think that's exactly right. Well, you put it right that it's a, it's a once in a lifetime sort of transition. Uh, and it's a, a massive challenge to address climate change and completely renovate our energy system in a certain way. Uh, but one of the things that was not foreseen when we started down this road of uh, using government policy to deploy clean energy, things like solar and wind and batteries and electric vehicles, is that they are exponential technologies. And so the thing that's happening that's really dramatic is the combination of policy plus this exponentially plunging price of clean energy is driving a transition that in many ways is much more rapid than most people believed is possible. And is actually heading us towards an energy system that is not just cleaner and better for the planet, but is frankly cheaper. Lower cost energy, lower cost manufacturing, lower cost transportation. And that means that just now on the pure economics, even if we uh, stopped any climate policy, that would slow us down. But the transition is now almost inevitable at this point. It's extraordinary. And it does feel like it is really accelerating as well. I mean, as you see with the exponential growth curves in general, right? It looks like so many of these technologies are now accelerating. It looks like the uh, price performance, uh, the cost of these various things is you know, dramatically plunging, which we can get into. Um, so thank you for that. Super, super exciting. It's one of the most, I think, important trends to be aware of. And, uh, you know, as a, someone who cares deeply about this planet, uh, something that I'm excited to, very excited to, to see. Uh, I thought maybe we'd talk, you know, kind of work our way through some of the different energy generation sources to kind of help people get a, an understanding of, you know, what's happening there, the, the new technologies that are uh, potentially driving down the, the cost curve and what type of uh, adoptions and kind of implementation we're, we're seeing. So um, if that's cool with you, why don't we maybe start with wind power? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so wind power is the, uh, besides hydropower, it's sort of the, the granddaddy renewable resource. It got started much earlier than solar at scale. Uh, and it's, you know, in some ways it's considered a little bit more of a staid energy source on renewables, but really it, we've seen this incredible plunge in prices there as well. Uh, in the U.S. in 1980, electricity from wind power cost about 10 times what electricity from coal did. And now it costs half what electricity from coal does, even completely unsubsidized. So we see this continued reduction in cost from Wright's law, every doubling of the scale of wind power, drops the prices by about 20%. And then the emergence now of offshore wind, uh, as recently as 2017, we thought offshore wind would never be cost competitive, but really in Europe, uh, pushing into the North Sea, because Europe's very population dense, and it's getting harder and harder to build wind on land. We've seen this incredible plunge in prices with offshore wind getting built at zero subsidy. Now it's starting to come to North America, the East Coast of the US, starting to come to Asia. China will pass everyone in offshore wind before too long. And the next generation beyond that is floating offshore uh, in places like Japan, or the West Coast of the US, the continental shelf drops off extremely rapidly. So you can't have a bottom mounted offshore wind turbine, uh, but really it being pioneered by uh, oil and gas companies using their floating oil rig technology We've seen in just the last three years, the commercialization of these floating offshore platforms that can be further away from land over the horizon, not getting in from the NIMBY issues of seeing them and can access incredibly high speed winds. So it'll just produce very, very low cost power. So they, a whole lot of stuff happening. Are they uh, on the oil and gas company front, are they converting existing platforms or just using that technology to build new installations? Impression. They're just using that technology to build new installations. Though we have seen some things like uh, some of the ships that were built to service offshore oil rigs were actually converted early on uh, to be used as uh, you know, ships in the construction of offshore wind platforms. And we've also seen companies that are the, the EPCs, the support companies for construction for the uh, offshore oil industry uh, converting their business to do more and more for offshore wind. 
And what, how quickly is that price falling? You said uh, about a 20% reduction with the doubling of capacity. Is that happening every kind of two years or three years or one year? What are we, what are we seeing now? Wind power growth is slower than solar. So that's every four years, let's say, uh, yeah. except that offshore and now floating offshore are as a, in terms of percent annual growth, they're growing much more rapidly and they currently have steeper uh, price reduction curves, faster learning rates. So that's happening uh, really quite rapidly. Great, awesome. Uh, how about on the solar front? Solar is incredibly exciting. And solar, as I say, often makes wind power look slow and stagnant, even though wind power has been quite rapid. Uh, you know, if you look at just the cost of solar modules, solar panels, in 1975, it was about $100 per watt. Uh, and by the end of 2020, we're seeing you know, less than 20 cents a watt for panels that were frankly better, more durable, higher efficiency, took up less space. So it's a 500 times cost reduction in the cost of the underlying technology, which is unlike, it's faster than any other physical infrastructure. Besides computing and gene sequencing, it's basically the fastest learning rate we've ever seen in anything. And so now, you know, I say about both wind and solar, they had a first phase of existence where they had to be subsidized. They were just more expensive than new uh, power from coal or gas. And that lasted from you know, the beginning of these technologies in the 70s up till maybe 2015. Then they entered a second phase and solar dropped in, in price much more rapidly. It started off more expensive than wind even, dropped in price rapidly. And around, you know, in, actually in 2010, I wrote a piece for Scientific American looking at this exponential decline and saying that around 2015, we'd see solar prices lower than coal. And basically no one believed it at that time. Right. But that happened. Uh, and now in the five years since then, we've seen, so that's the second phase was cost competitive. Now we've seen solar in particular enter a third phase where we're starting to see solar contracts for whole solar projects, the cost of electricity, you know, what's being paid by the buyer of electricity that are cheaper than the fuel cost of already built coal or gas plants. So the, the cost of, uh, wow. it's just stunning. The cost, let's say in Europe, the, the operational cost, the variable cost of an existing gas plant is maybe five cents a kilowatt hour. Now we've seen deals in Spain or Portugal, for instance, that are in the two cent or lower range for new built solar. And so that's the third phase where it's literally cheaper to build new solar and new wind to some extent than it is to keep operating existing fossil fuel power plants. And that's massively disruptive to, you know, literally several trillion dollars of uh, built assets. So, so how quickly are we seeing new solar assets kind of coming online and how quickly are we seeing some of these older uh, energy generation technologies kind of going, going offline? Is it still, is there a, a lag and this is, you know, still a few years out or are we really starting to see this major uh, transition away from coal and, and uh, you know, uh, more just some of the historical energy generating sources? There is some lag and energy, you know, it's not always a completely open market. Uh, and so there's some regulatory capture and there's some structures that slow things down in some cases. Uh, but solar, so solar is less than 3% of the world's electricity, but it's had basically a 40%. What was the percent? Uh, a little bit less than 3%. 3%, okay, wow, but so it's still tiny, yep. It's still tiny, but it's had about a 40% CAGR, so a doubling every two years for the last 20 years. It slowed down a bit for a few years in the, you know, uh, leading up to 2020, but now we're seeing acceleration again. Um, and in terms of shutdown, so in the US, for instance, the coal fleet has, you know, coal generation has dropped by half in about the last 11 years. About 60% of that has been displaced by natural gas and 40% of it by uh, solar and wind. But that's over the last 11 years. Over the last four or five years, it's been predominantly renewables. Uh, and now we see things like in the in Indiana, in the US, red state voted for Donald Trump by 19 points. Uh, we have a utility there, NIPSCO, Northern Indiana Power Company, that announced in their five-year plan that they're, they're currently 65% coal powered, but that it would save their customers about $4 billion to shut down all of that coal power, not even build any new gas, 
just build solar, wind, batteries, and flexible demand, like EV charging that's responsive to when power is cheapest. So that's just stunning. That is so exciting. I mean, it's so it's the economics uh, that are going to right transcend all the political friction around some of the of this transition, and think will really accelerate it, which is exciting to see. Um, what are you seeing in countries like India or China that have just a huge number of of coal plants? Are you seeing uh, that transition happening to solar or to wind, and and is it? I don't know if you have any stats around kind of the number of plants that are getting shut down or are still being built. Are plants still being built, coal plants? And China is still building coal plants, uh, not a lot. And it's, it's a sort of a weird situation. The central government has said we should stop building coal. The provinces have more power than people realize, and the incentives are not always aligned. So a lot of the new coal plants that are being built are stranded assets almost immediately but the people uh, in charge of building them get rewarded for juicing their province level GDP numbers. Um, so in China, China is the number one deployer of both solar and wind. We see massive growth and we see China has just, China is less sunny than the US, most of it is, but China has just you know, started its unsubsidized solar build out. Essentially it's removed a lot of the feed in tariffs and subsidies for solar. And nevertheless, the market is growing. There's more unsubsidized solar being built than expected. India has, uh, you know, if you look at the coal power plants that were on the books in China that were planned five years ago, uh, two thirds of those have, are now scrapped or stalled, but there's still a little bit in the pipeline. India, it's like 90% of the coal power plants that were planned five years ago have been scrapped or stalled. There's still a small number being built but in India, India is substantially sunnier than China. What we see is, if you look at the, the cost of new solar versus the operating cost, the fuel cost of existing coal power plants, it looks like new solar is cheaper than the operating cost of at least half of the coal fleet and maybe two thirds. So India has you know, a little bit of a Trumpian West Virginia sort of thing, which is that even more than the US, coal is, arguably the largest industry in India between coal mining and railways and so on. So there's this sort of a jobs angle of maybe the government propping up existing coal plants because of uh, the employment issues and so on. Nevertheless, the economics just mean the writing is on the wall. So interesting and, and so exciting. How about um, any other uh, energy generation technologies, whether it's water or uh, nuclear, uh, that you, you think we should touch on and important for people to kind of understand or fusion? Solar and wind are definitely the ones that, that we now see. There's just this obvious price trend that will carry them forward. Nevertheless, there's, you know, nuclear fission has had a rough decade or decade and a half. There are various new reactor designs that are going forward. Uh, small modular is part of it, other things. We'll see that industry has really struggled to control costs, let alone bring costs down. And then fusion is super exciting. You know, I've seen fusion happen on multiple occasions. There's lots of startups in the space. I have a lot more confidence in the startups than the government projects because the startups are in sort of a fail fast mode instead of a you know, $20 billion uh, reactor project. It's what can we build for you know, a few million dollars in the small scale and, and learn and iterate if it doesn't work. Nevertheless, I think it's anyone's guess uh, when, if ever, we'll actually have cost-effective uh, fusion power. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, there's uh, there's multiple private companies now that uh, are claiming they're very, very close to net positive energy uh, generation and uh, uh, TEA or TAE Commonwealth. We had Steve Jurvetson on a few months ago. Mm -hmm. He's a investor in that. And, you know, both of them seem to be almost there. And, you know, scientists have been saying that for a while, so we'll see. But um, it's been interesting to see kind of hundreds of millions of dollars go into supporting these companies. And these companies feel like they're, you know, close to, to being able to generate um, uh, energy, which net positive energy, which will be exciting. Um, That's been so the most exciting time we've seen in fusion ever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. How about on the energy storage side? It feels like a part, you know, critical part of kind of store uh, of solving our uh, the energy equation and this transition uh, to kind of more sustainable uh, energy sources that might not be available 24 hours a day is having 
an updated uh, energy storage system in place, having uh, a more uh, sophisticated grid in place. What's, what's happening there? Storage is incredibly exciting. And storage is sort of where solar was 10 years ago, I'd say. It plunging in price, similar pace to solar, but maybe even faster than new technologies. I'd say you know, five years ago, there was basically there were almost no batteries on the grid. We, we used pumped hydro. If you've got a dam, you can use power to pump water back up. Uh, but the concept of having batteries on the grid was almost unknown. Now in the US, you know, probably a third of new solar projects are being built with batteries using lithium ion batteries, the same batteries in your phone or laptop or EV. Um, that, so four hour storage is starting to become cost effective, I would say on the verge, but there's also an explosion of new battery chemistries. And there's probably a bifurcation happening is my thesis. We'll go one direction for uh, mobile sort of devices with electric vehicles or, or phones and a different direction for the grid. On the grid side, we actually just had our first exit from my syndicates uh, for a, a flow battery company. Uh, I think we wrote our first check at a $4.3 million uh, pre-money and they're getting spacked up at, a, at over a billion. So we have a pretty happy about that right now. Uh, that yeah. That's ESS, uh, Energy Storage Systems, ESS Inc. You can look them up. And what they make is a flow battery uh, using iron and salt. So no rare earth uh, materials, nothing scarce. Uh, it has you know, can be cost effective storage for 12 hours or longer. So it, it basically, yeah, if everything works as planned, we've basically solved the day night cycle. Um, you know, as I think I said earlier, imagine a new coal plant can be built at about six cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. New solar in the US getting down to, you know, three cents, two cents, the Department of Energy thinks the average cost of new solar in the US is about two cents by 2030. And we're looking at storage at about two cents as well. So now you're talking about for the day night cycle, a combination of solar, wind and storage with this flow battery or other similar technologies cheaper than uh, coal or gas. So there's multiple other contenders, uh, flow batteries, uh, uh, liquid metal batteries, so on. But the multi-hour, you know, day and night, I think we've got incredible progress on. The area that's still under development is what we call seasonal storage. Uh, the renewables not only have sort of fluctuation on the scale of hours or a day, they have substantial differences over the course of months. You can imagine in North America, we get roughly twice as much sunlight in July as we do in January. Right. And so you need to compensate for that in some way, whether it's just massively overbuilding solar or the fact that solar and wind are somewhat opposite in seasonality. But sometimes you have a period in winter, we have got little sun and you might have several days without good wind. And so the next frontier is building uh, energy storage technology that can store a week or 10 days of energy. And there we have, in Europe, the big bet is on hydrogen, using excess renewables to run electrolyzers and make hydrogen that you can store. There's companies like Form Energy, a sodium is sulfur that, flow battery. On the hydrogen side, would that be combusted? <clears throat> Probably. Uh, you could put, yeah, you could put the hydrogen into a fuel cell, which would be more efficient to turn it back into electricity, okay. but the fuel cells cost more. So we build something a lot like a natural gas power plant, it, but uh, for hydrogen. In fact, we see some new natural gas power plants being built that are being built uh, sort of hydrogen ready that the, the builders think, well, we might not be burning gas uh, 10 years from now. We're going to build it in such a way that we can combust hydrogen in it down the road. Nice. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt the, the oh, train. No, I can um, just yammer on about clean energy technologies for hours. So please interrupt. So yeah, so um, so it's clear that we're you know moving in towards basically the the democratization and essentially the abundance of, of energy. Um, it's pretty astounding still what percentage of the world's populace does not have access to consistent energy. Um, but we're heading in that direction, and it sounds like you know with solar, some of the world's poorest countries basically are also some of the the best places for things like like solar. Um, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on, you know, maybe painting a picture of what is a, 
a world of energy abundance look like? Are we heading towards a place essentially with a you know zero cost or you know where energy becomes almost free? I think we're heading to a place where you know the unit cost of energy as a fraction of income just drops and drops and drops and drops. Right? I don't know if it'll ever be free, but it might be cheap enough to create some interesting business models of ad-supported energy, for instance. I'm not sure if it's a good idea or bad. But when the cost gets so low, you can imagine your energy being bundled with some other service that somebody wants to sell you, for instance. Um, and I do think at the point that you raise, well, hey, that's lower cost of energy is just phenomenal for economic growth overall, because energy is an important input to manufacturing, other resources, transportation, housing, whatnot, right? Um, and as you point, we still have this challenge of you know, 1.1 billion people on planet Earth don't have access to electricity, really. And probably another billion have sort of intermittent or not really great electricity. The as you point out, the bulk of those are in sunny places, South Asia, you know, India in particular, and Sub-Saharan Africa being the bulk and a little bit in Latin America. Uh, and the plunge in price of solar does open up a lot of new opportunities. And now we see the solar itself is cheap enough. Uh, and the next level of challenges are uh, really about things like that these people are unbanked in many cases and how do they pay for a solar system? Uh, so things like the spread of mobile phones and, and things like M-Pesa and so on, I think are actually potentially the linchpin in unlocking access to energy for people in the developing world. Interesting. Um, thank you for that. Are, overall, are you optimistic that uh, we are going to be able to, to solve uh, climate change and, and to be able to, you know, with this shift towards uh, new, more sustainable energy sources, be able to, to kind of make that transition uh, way significantly ahead of, uh, of where people think it, it's, we're currently heading? Yeah, I'd say it's not black or white. Um, you know, often we talk about climate change of oh, 1.5 degrees Celsius we have to do or two degrees Celsius we have to do. And people, you know, might have an attitude of at a tenth of a degree below that, everything's fine, a tenth of a degree over that, the world ends. But that's not how it, it actually is. So I'd say we have more work to do and we're making great progress. When I started working in climate energy you know, a decade ago, we were, most people would have said we were on pace for four degrees to six degrees Celsius of warming which is about the delta between the temperature now and the heart of the ice age, uh, you know, 13, 15,000 years ago. So it doesn't sound like that much, but it's actually tremendous. Now, I'd say we're on path for something like 2.5 degrees Celsius or lower, and two degrees Celsius is within reach. Um, 1.5 degrees Celsius is now what people are really pushing for. That's extremely, extremely difficult. So it, we're in a situation where we're making tremendous progress. We still have hard problems to solve. We use a lot of energy for things like industry, making steel, making cement. Those are behind where clean electricity is. We still have a tremendous amount of emissions from deforestation, agriculture, cattle, that sort of thing. So there's a lot more work to do, but we're also making faster progress than ever before. And the plunge in the cost of clean energy makes it possible to imagine actually largely succeeding. Gotcha, thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about the beginning, there at the beginning about your, you being an active angel investor and all these syndicates. We've got lots of investors who are uh, on this call today. Um, be interested to get your take on, on kind of where you think there are emerging opportunities for kind of early stage and, and kind of mid-stage uh, investing. Yeah, well, it's the best time to be an investor in, in climate energy ever, uh, in part because the, the new technologies have gotten so cheap that it is an explosion of scale, and in part because their policy aspirations around the world are rising and rising and rising. The EU, you know, uh, just in December updated their binding targets for 2030 to be a 55% reduction in carbon emissions from 1990. And now they're working towards getting a binding law across the EU that would be complete decarbonization by 2050, for instance. So what are the sectors? I mean, I think there's still interesting stuff happening in electricity generation, but that's a little bit more mature. Energy storage continues to be extremely interesting. Uh, electrification of transport uh, is a place that I'm you know, spending more and more 
time. Uh, electric vehicles, light storage, are basically where solar was a decade ago. It's hard to believe with Tesla's valuation, but you know, EVs are still you know less than about 0.1% of all cars on the road are electric vehicles. So you can see that it's still an order of magnitude or more below where solar is. So the, the opportunity there is tremendous and there's interesting opportunities in electric vehicle charging, We've made a couple of recent investments in that space. We see a lot of exits in that sector. Uh, interesting, a lot of the exits are because traditional fossil fuel companies are now terrified, especially the Europeans who see, see things coming more clearly than the American companies do, I think. So we've seen you know, BP, Shell, or uh, Italian utility, and now or expansion to the Iberdrola making acquisition after acquisition in the EV charging network space. Uh, there's a tremendous software opportunity, both in the, the managing the grid with all of our variable uh, power and a variable controllable demand and software for doing things like uh, managing the interaction between electric vehicles to be the largest flexible power demand with the availability of clean power on the grid. Uh, I'm invested in Ampli that, that you and I invested in together uh, has some aspects of that. Another portfolio company of mine, WeaveGrid, uh, is uh, very much in that space. We have an exciting announcement to make, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, uh, things with them. Uh, and then beyond that, now we see, you know, how do we decarbonize industry, steel and cement? How do we decarbonize aviation? Uh, things like that are starting to look viable, much more early stage, uh, but huge markets if we can succeed. Gotcha. With that, Mez, I want to say thank you so much for, for joining us and for sharing some of your, your insights and, and great wisdom. Super insightful. Uh, I find it incredibly inspiring and, and exciting and, uh, and looking forward to this major transition that's, uh, that's going to happen. And, and hopefully we're going to find a lot of opportunities for us to be uh, able to, to do some additional investing together. Indeed. Thanks, Will. It's been an honor and a delight. Thank you.